Uh, welcome, Dean, Joanna, Lisa. Good to have you all here. Good to see your, your faces again. Um, okay, I'm, I'm just going to get going and, and hope people uh, make it in. Uh, so this is our session on mutual aid and the great unraveling. It's the second of a two-part series. My name is Rob Dietz. I am the program director at Post Carbon Institute. And uh, we're excited to have uh, Dean and Aliza and Joanna with us. I will give you a, a little bit more formal introduction uh, of them in, in just a minute. Um, but first, I, I just want to give the, the shortest recap of what we covered in part one and uh, a little overview of what we're going to do today. So in, in part one of the series, which took place last week, it featured Daniel Aldrich, uh, Amira Oda, and our very own Richard Heinberg. They did this awesome job of setting the scene by describing the converging crises we face and then exploring why social ties are so critical and why mutual aid is, is important and where we're headed. And they touched on some ways to encourage stronger social ties and, and to recover from disasters. In part two today, we're going to dive more deeply into mutual aid. We'll start with a brief review of what mutual aid is, but we're mainly going to focus on how to participate in mutual aid, how to initiate and, and promote mutual aid projects, and hopefully, uh, if we do our jobs here, inspire you to take action in your communities. Uh, what we're really after is we want people to go from learning and understanding things to doing things that will help people in their communities to build trust and, and meet needs. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. We will, for people that uh, have made a donation, we'll have a video available starting tomorrow of, of both webinars. Uh, and also Clara is in the background compiling resources. So if you all share uh, websites and books and things like that in the chat, uh, she's going to be grabbing those. We've also will have some from our panelists as well, and and that document will be shared with with everybody. Um, so yeah, lots of lots of follow on possibilities. Okay, I want to uh, welcome our guests. Um, let me go through a a, uh, a you know a quick bio for each of you, and then I'll uh, start us off with a question. Uh, joining us today, we've got Dean Spade, who is a professor at the Seattle University School of Law. He's been working to build queer and trans liberation based in racial and economic justice for the past two decades. He's an author, documentary director, uh, and creator of the Mutual Aid Toolkit at BigDoorBrigade.com, which uh, I, I looked through it and looks incredible. His latest book is Mutual Aid, Building Solidarity During This Crisis and the Next. And it offers both a theoretical understanding of mutual aid and practical tools for, for building and sustaining a movement. Uh, when I met Dean prior to this, I, I could readily see his excitement to share ideas, books, websites, and all these other resources uh, with me as we were talking. Uh, so welcome to Dean. Joanna Swan practices harm reduction and works as an organizer with Streetwatch LA. Uh, she trained in coalition with Skid Row organizers at the Los Angeles Community Action Network, which is also called LA CAN. Uh, Streetwatch LA works with unhoused communities to fight the criminalization of poverty and acknowledges that an end to homelessness will not be achieved through the charity frameworks that, that we see and are, are tied to systemic racism and capitalism. Uh, so Joanna is currently organizing with unhoused tenants of a Project Room Key Hotel as they fight for dignity and permanent housing. Um, when I met and spoke with Joanna, I actually experienced this literal easing in my chest. <laughs> it, was, uh, uh, it was because of what she was saying and, uh, and helping break down, uh, helping me understand the concept of breaking down binaries, you know, for example, this binary that exists between houseless people living on the streets and the businesses that are operating in the same areas. So welcome to Joanna. And we also have Aliza Tuttle, who is a senior research assistant at Portland State University. She is a food action team facilitator with the Corvallis Sustainability Coalition 
and co-founded It's On Us, or IOU Corvallis, as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic. When she saw the effects on the local food economy uh, and the, the community at large, she wanted to do something that brought people together and challenged emergency food systems, charity, and, and the meaning of food aid. And when I got to meet Eliza, I was struck by uh, her ability to think in systems and really inspired by the way she can apply big picture concepts and, and bring them down to the, the smaller scale in the community, which is a skill set that's going to be more and more in demand um, as we you know, experience uh, the great unraveling. Okay, I want to get to our panelists. Um, Dean, let me let me start with you uh, with your book on mutual aid and the toolkit that I mentioned at, at BigDoorBrigade.com, uh, the courses you teach and, and your participation in events. Uh, you've become kind of a go-to person on the subject of mutual aid, and I know it's asking a lot, but um, could you just give us the the condensed ten-minute refresher on on what mutual aid is and and what it is not? Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much for organizing this event. It's such a delight to be with a bunch of people in this room who all know that we are in the great unraveling, because sometimes that's even hard to, to have these conversations about the urgency with which we come to this work when um, people are in, of course, for many good reasons, a lot of denial or misinformation about kind of what disasters are going to keep arriving for the rest of our lives and, and how much we need each other. So really excited about the framing of this. I am calling in from Duwamish land, Seattle, Washington. Um, yeah, so um, I think of mutual aid, you know, mutual aid became like pretty visible, especially at the beginning of COVID. And then also with the big uprising in 2020, after the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, we saw like a lot of food projects with COVID getting a lot of um, uh, coverage, you know, people doing a lot uh, to raise money for each other who were out of work because certain industries were not happening because of COVID. We also saw during the uprising things like people doing street medic work so that people could be in the streets and, you know, treating each other for tear gas. And like we saw, you know, I think like like a record breaking numbers of people donated to bail funds, which is a kind of mutual aid um, during the um, during the beginning of the uprising um, to try to bail out protesters and other people impacted by police um, targeting. So we mutual aid as a concept kind of mainstreamed, like it was that term was in the media in a way that I don't think it ever has been before. And a lot of people learned that term. Usually we see that mutual aid covered more with like acute disasters, like there'll be like a hurricane and we'll see coverage of people rescuing each other in their boats. Um, or you know, helping rebuild or something. Um, but for the first time since COVID happened everywhere all at once, we saw, I think, like a different level of coverage and a discussion of this thing. And so many people did mutual aid projects who had never done them before, which is so beautiful and exciting in terms of preparation for coming disasters. Um, Sometimes the media, the mainstream corporate media portrays mutual aid as just volunteerism. And so the real thing that a lot of my work is about is trying to name actually mutual aid has a huge role in resistance and transformative movements and isn't just when we volunteer like until the government shows up or something, you know, which of course we know um, not only does it not show up, it actually facilitates the disasters and creates the disasters that we're living in. So I define mutual aid as three kind of big pieces. One it's just the term for like the part of our social movement ecosystem that's about giving each other like the basic survival needs. So we do a lot of things in our social movement work, right? We, you know, lay down in front of coal trains and we block and sabotage pipelines and we make awesome videos and, you know, we do lots and lots of kinds of work. Mutual aid is the part of the work. That's when we meet each other's survival needs, food, childcare, supporting elders, healthcare needs, like, you know, any of that stuff. Um, uh, I think something is only actually mutual aid if it also does two other things. One, it's based in a shared understanding by participants that the problem isn't the people in crisis. The problem is the systems that put people in crisis. So we're not blaming people for being unhoused or for being poor or for being criminalized. We're saying there's something wrong with a system that puts people in cages, that makes a housing system where people don't have housing, that you know makes us a healthcare system for profit that makes a, um, a industrialization that produces climate change, et cetera. So that's key that we have, it's based out of this shared understanding that looks at the problem as the root causes of the problem instead of blaming people for being in crisis. And then the other big piece is that it's mutual aid if it includes an invitation to collective action. So in our movements, we know 
um, you know, people are in crisis because they're bad and we just need to fix them and they need to take a budgeting class and they need to, you know, get, you know, like this kind of like personal responsibility, like right wing rhetoric that also has been very much indulged by um, all the Democrats for many, many decades. Um, we know that actually the real roots of the problem are the way our systems are organized and that collective action is the only way out. So a mutual aid project is a mutual aid project because it says like, oh, hey, like, yeah, you need help with your eviction defense. We'd love to help you. And do you want to get involved in our project or do you want to get involved in housing justice stuff in our city? And you don't have to, we'll still help you with your eviction defense. But hey, you're, there's always an invitation to join the movement for collective action to say, hey, we don't think what's happening to you is your fault. We think it's the system. Do you want to fight the system with us? And let's take care of your needs right now. So the reason I say those three things is because we live in a context where there's like a charity model in the U.S. and this framework is not mutual aid. Um, the charity model, you know, is based in like European Christian kind of ideas about like rich people giving money to the poor, like to get into heaven. It tends to be focused on celebrating rich people. Like today, that means like PR for Bill Gates or whoever billionaire is giving money to something or PR for corporations for look, appearing to be slightly interested in the environment or gay rights or whatever. Um, charity is the model that shapes our social services industries. It's like, it, it's about blaming and controlling poor people. It's like, oh, you're unhoused. You need to get sober. You need to take these psych meds. You need to take this budgeting class. You need, you know, and then it's also about sorting the deserving from the undeserving. So these disaster victims will get support, but these ones, they were homeless already. So they, so there's no, FEMA has nothing for them or, you know, this kind of, um, and, and with poverty, it's often like, oh, sorry, you have a felony in your history, so you can't be, you can't be on this wait list for housing, or you have um, you're not sober, so you can't. So in chair, the charity model is about blaming people for being in crisis and then controlling them if it gives them any crumbs. So it's really system sustaining. It says, oh yeah, it's, it, the the billionaires billionaireness is legit, and the poor people who are on the bottom, it's because there's something wrong with them, and we'll slightly tinker and give a few crumbs, but we won't. Um, indict the system. Mutual aid indicts the system. Mutual aid is about building movements that are big, that can dismantle a world in which anybody is unhoused, a world in which anybody can pollute, a world in which anybody doesn't have clean water and air um, in their community. And so the other thing that's important about mutual aid to me is that mutual aid projects, childcare, healthcare, all this stuff, you know, food, community fridge, whatever, um, uh, you know, maybe some of you are thinking about like the 1960s and 70s, all the health projects, like all the women's health clinics that came up and all the um, specific, you know, clinics that were in Black and Puerto Rican communities that were part of those movements against racism. You know, you can, there's so much mutual aid. Anyway, um, mutual aid tends to be the main way people enter social movements. And we need a lot of people to enter social movements and become long-term participants and become part of making big change and taking really bold action if we're going to get even anyone to survive any of the crises that we're facing, right? Both to reduce human suffering as much as we can right now, and also to hopefully like stop the, the machines that are making things worse. And so people tend to enter movements because either like they needed something and these people at this mutual aid project were giving it out and we're like, hey, guess what? We think this whole thing is messed up. Join us. And it was a politicizing moment or because they were mad about what they saw happening to other people they love or the people on the news or it happened to them before. And they were like, I want to help. Like people first most people, it's this beautiful quality. We want to help when we see crisis. So most people join mutual aid projects as their way of getting involved. It's not symbolic. It's not just like a symbolic statement. I'm not like just posting something online or just waiting to vote or hoping something is going to happen if I give some money to a nonprofit. It's like, I want to do something right now to stop the pain, the harm, the suffering. It's And then I go and do that. I go and like take part in something and I find out more about what, how this problem works. And I, my solidarities grow. Like at first I was really mad that like kids were being put into jails on the border, but then I get there and I'm like working with other people, supporting folks, maybe in the det detention center near my um, home. And I'm like, oh, you know what? I'm pissed this is happening to adults too. Wow. And I never actually realized how immigrants with disabilities have particular obstacles in the system. I never realized how this relates to the criminal system and the police being so targeting of black people means that black immigrants are more likely to end up in this system. And you, you just, you learn like, oh my God, the detention center is on the Superfund site. Like you, so your politics of resistance grows. And a lot of people move from doing mutual aid, which we all do our entire lives in the movement, to also doing other kinds of action and getting bolder and bolder as we grow those solidarities. We get more urgent, more angry. We have more political connections with others and thoughts about how change works. And then we might be taking some other actions too. Like we're going to do a tree sit or we're going to block the pipeline or we're going to 
all the things that you all know we need to do. Um, so, um, so mutual aid is just really like vital. And I'll just say one more thing about it. It's kind of written out of social movement histories. Like we're told that social movements make change when just like, you know, uh, men make speeches and like people vote for things and courts do stuff. And actually um, those things are always the things that happen at the end. You know, the thing that that's really going on is tons and tons and tons of ordinary people being organized, people we've never heard of. And that gets really eclipsed by the stories we have about social movements. And the reason that is, is because those stories are meant to demobilize us and make us feel like ordinary people don't have anything that we can do and that we should just wait around um, until like the legislature takes care of it or the, um, or, you know, if we, if we just post the right things on social media, maybe people will realize, you know, um, in reality, we have to just take this thing in our hands, right. And just actually, um, provide for each other immediately and just gum up the works, make it impossible for them to keep doing the things they're doing. However, we can do that. So um, the, the, the erasure of mutual aid as part of social movement history, and I can give you a million examples, um, is, is strategic and it's against our mobilization and we need to like reframe that. So a lot of the reason I've done all this work trying to like talk about mutual aid is just to help people notice its vital role. And because I think we desperately need everyone to be doing it because there is so much uh, suffering and crisis. Thanks, Dean. A, a really, really uh, strong summary of, of what it is. And I, you know, I feel like I'm learning so much about mutual aid and excited to hear uh, some ideas about uh, how we put it into practice. Uh, so let me, let me turn to you, Joanna. You've been putting these concepts into practice through, through your work with the houseless community in, in Los Angeles. And I'm wondering if you can share with our audience what you've been doing with, with Streetwatch LA and, and how you engage the community in your work. Cool, thanks Rob. Um, and thanks everyone for putting this on and being here. Uh, my name's Joanna, uh, I use pronouns she, her. I'm coming from unceded Gabrieleno Keach land, otherwise known as Los Angeles. Um, I, like many people, as Dean just mentioned, came into mutual aid through like my own needs. Um, I learned about tenant organizing as a tenant who was facing eviction, um, sort of occupying that in-between space of, you know, living in the warehouses as they are being colonized by tech money or luxury capitalism. Um, in Los Angeles, that's uh, sometimes like a big driver. <laughs> Um, recently on the west side, on the east side, in downtown, um, and like it's a really beautiful thing to feel you come to a meeting and you're coming with your own needs and your own concerns, but as you hear the people around you expressing their needs and their concerns and it starts to like build into a net and an understanding that this is like a systemic thing that we actually do have power um, if we are together in that, in that understanding, um, the organizing that can happen um, if you stick around and keep coming to the meetings. <laughs> but um, I think, yeah, I, I wanna share some slides. I don't know, I'm a very visual person. And so it's kind of hard for me to just talk about all the stuff we do, but um, like Streetwatch really started out as uh, like a cop watch group. So we came from, uh, Skid Row organizing, um, specifically Black radical tradition that's existed in that um, neighborhood for decades um, and has come out of the need to protect um, protect the community of unhoused folks there. Um, let me, I'm going to do this really share screen thing real quick. Um, I've got, let's see, I've got my timer going. So I'll be, I'll try, I am so bad at rambling. So just like make a gesture. Um, and if I'm talking too fast also, please let me know. Um, just anybody. Uh, so yeah, we came out of um, housed folks, housed organizers in the local DSA chapter, housing and homelessness committee working and learning from mentors and coalition organizers in Skid Row with LA CAN or Los Angeles Community Action Network. Um, so like for us, a lot of the mutual aid comes from honoring and, and drawing power from the, the art and the skills and, um, just like talents that people on the street are bringing that is so often completely glossed over and erased. Um, 
This is like a lino cut from one of our fallen comrades in the Bay Area who's organizing with the Re Western Regional Advocacy Project, which is a coalition group that Street Watch also organizes with, um, kind of brings a network of uh, organizing, homeless organizing like across the country and the state. Um, on the left, we have uh, one of my dear friends and mentors, General Dogon, ripping up an award that he was given by the, the mayor um, when they brought a, a small amount of toilets after years of organizing for bathrooms. Um, and Skid Row still has like the, the least amount of resources across the city, but as homelessness has grown, we've seen these needs exist in other places in the Valley, in the South Bay on the West side. Um, and so that's a big reason why we started trying to build that work out that's happened in Skid Row for so long. Um, and so we started out just learning from folks like what sweeps are like and what it actually is when the city says that they're doing a cleanup in the area um, and sort of the weaponizing of ideas of safety and of cleanliness um, and how when in the state's framework that often just translates to banishment, anti-Blackness, um, ableism and uh, compounding harm. So um, I'm just gonna run through these things. We don't have time for everything, but we see like in public records requests in um, interacting with the city that that sanitation in Los Angeles actually has a policy of removing trash cans that are used too often. And so we see like this, what Ruth Gilmore calls like organized abandonment that happens on every level and affects people who are then scapegoated and, and framed for the general public as the reason why there is trash or there's, you know, shit on the streets. That's the thing we hear over and over, the poop and needles thing, right? And it's like, for me, someone who works in harm reduction as someone who's a drug user it's like yeah like people aren't going to stop shitting and they're not going to stop using drugs sorry i'm uh, my language um so just some like a lot of wordiness on this slide but basically the idea that uh the powers that be namely like developers and real estate interests um are very invested in removing things like public bathrooms and hand washing stations and anything related to harm reduction um, for people who use drugs, because in their view, that's enabling homelessness or enabling practices that the, everyone needs <laughs> to, to be able to do safely. Um, how am I on time, Rob? Uh, maybe just a, a minute or two more and then we'll okay I'm we'll gonna skip to forward I'm yeah. sorry I will anyone who wants to talk more about this I can talk for way too long about all this stuff so just um I'll draw my email later um so one form of mutual aid is simply showing up with a camera with some flyers about the laws that criminalize homelessness and be like hey do you guys know what's up do you guys have problems with the sweeps what's going on documenting civil rights abuse that um, can be used in many ways. Um, during the pandemic, we started doing a lot more focusing on some of the material resources that aren't being met, like charging your phone. Um, most people charge their phones in libraries or cafes. So of course, when the pandemic started, it was, those things were basically all closed. So um, we kind of took some direction from our comrades in Skid Row that had made this really amazing charge and chill bicycle um one of another one of our fallen comrades Eddie H was a big part of coming up with that um and the idea of bringing power out to the to the block while you talk to folks about you know recent issues at um LAPD recent issues at city council um ordinances that are coming down that might be affecting the community so like we started doing that at Echo Park Lake um we had folks that were living at the lake, folks that weren't living at the lake, just coming with battery banks. Um, you can see there's Narcan and then a bunch of nerdy flyers that actually um, really helped to become a hub for uh, like know your rights training, sort of off the cuff organizing that would happen. And um, on the on the right, there's another photograph that's a, a power up banner um, on a table that has a charging station um, poster and 
um, actually one of our comrades actually built a, a power charger with some motorcycle batteries. And so like a lot of our work is like also trying to get this stuff for free. Like we do fundraise, but like I'm all about the free stuff. And like, I think that's such a beautiful part of like street economy is like the barter economy that happens there. And like the way that people are super good at finding what they need. Um, and like, I, to me, that's been a really beautiful part of our power up tables is also having folks on the block who DJ bring in their little phone with the DJ app, getting the speaker. We, you know, like in terms of de-escalation, um, being in touch with residents on the block where we're doing these power ups who are able to help us um, and sometimes us help them not involve police when things are getting tense. Um, there's a lot of learning that can happen there. So yeah, this is just to say that there is like, this is also like harm reduction because we know that folks who have been trying to charge their phones have, you know, that has led to police brutality. Um, people are being criminalized and also put at risk when they are basically forced to tap into like street lighting, which happens a lot. And that's often used as an excuse to clear entire communities. Um, even though that's something that like is, like should be recognized as a human right, electricity, um, you know? So Rob, I feel like I'm going way over, but- Yeah, um, let's, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have some more time to come back. I do want to, I, I love the building of community and the ingenuity uh, that you see in Street Watch. Uh, you know, even just seeing the picture of you with your colleagues at the table, like, yeah, a perfect place to, to, uh, uh, it, to increase the social ties, uh, just yeah, it's inspiring. Um, I want to I want to turn it to Aliza. Um, you know, Street Watch is uh, an organization that's got a, a, a history to it. You you mentioned Joanna about the uh, decades long history of, in the Black community, and um, and I think that's in contrast to to what you've done, Aliza, uh, which is start something completely new. And so, uh, you know, I, I know you've been involved in, in, in the food system and your research and kind of big picture stuff, even up to the international scale. So I'm really curious about how you went from thinking food to starting this organization uh, when the pandemic hit. So yeah, maybe you can uh, give us a primer on how you organize that and why it, uh, why it came about. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much. And I'm so honored to be here, truly. Um, and I'm calling from the traditional homeland of the Ampanefu Band of the Kalapuya in Corvallis, Oregon. Um, so we, yeah, I um, started, you know, this response during the COVID-19 pandemic, like you, like you said, um, because uh, other people came to me and said, what do we do? And I, um, grew up in kind of the food not bombs, mutual aid worlds, um, lived in a student co-op, was, you know, protesting at the door of the president of the university. And then I realized, you know, we need those groups, absolutely. And I don't, I don't really think I am best there. I think I am more of a translator. I think that um, I, you know, am a I'm a white presenting female. I'm uh, educated. I have a master's degree and my skill set can be used in a different way where I can um, I can be in spaces that uh, others just, you know, have been excluded from purposefully and just aren't invited to. So, um, for example, somebody came to me and said, you know, I have extra. I have extra in this time and I don't know what to do. And I saw this as an opportunity in my little college town. Um, we have lots of college professors. We have upper administration folks who during the pandemic, we know got more wealthy because of the systems in place while others in our town just um, got, got, you know, descended deeper into poverty of social relationships, of, um, of food, of resources. And um, we came up with this idea of how do we talk about mutual aid without using the words mutual aid? And how do we break down this concept of deservedness using something that is not scary for administration? 
you know, for professors who um, are, you know, maybe are turned off by the more radical uh, brandings of mutual aid. And we're going to break down these systems in a way that draws folks in. So we asked our community to uh, give us money. And we said, you know, you give us money, we're going to support the local economy. And then we want the local community to come and support the local restaurants. So in that way, we were asking um, everyone to help. People who are getting food were helping to support the restaurants. People who are giving money were helping to uh, spread, you know, nutrition and food and helping the local economy and restaurants. And, you know, we just didn't talk about who was getting the food. And I think um, just really quickly, I have a really favorite story that um, I love. It's, I love it because it happened a lot. Um, and in this specific circumstance, somebody called me at 9.30 at night, I think, and was irate. She was so mad. She said, you know, I'm downtown, I'm getting a drink with my friend and a homeless person just walked by and told me to go to one of our upscale restaurants that we had partnered with because he just got a free steak and I've donated to you and I don't, I don't want my money to go to something like this because I don't think that homeless people should get steak. And I just, you know, sat with her for a moment and then I said, you know, why not? Like, what about that makes makes you come to me in this moment and call me? Aren't you giving money to the restaurant? And when do you think the last time that person had steak was? And, you know, why not? And she sat in silence and then hung up on me, which is totally fine. But I think that we are using this program to, um, to, to point to the pandemic and to point to COVID-19 as kind of this neon sign that just says, you know, COVID shows us that the system is really failing and really the system has been failing. Um, and it's the system, it's not individuals fault that they, you know, deserve food or not, or what type of food they deserve. Um, and how can we continue this conversation of it's the system, not the individual in a way that engages people with power and money? I hope that answered your question. Yeah, thank you. Really uh, makes me think a lot about the challenges that we face and um, changing attitudes and, and beliefs and values. Um, and, and I do want to, I want to start turning us towards kind of the how to, um, so Dean, let me turn to you. Um, one of the ideas that, that you've, uh, that you've described why we need mutual aid networks is that the system's broken. And a part of that is that the cavalry isn't coming to save us. We can't rely on the state or the market or, or some whatever, them, they over there to come in and, and rescue us or, or solve the problems that are in our, our neighborhoods, especially as these crises of the great unraveling uh, get, get worse and worse. So to me, that, Im that implies that we need some degree of organizing people in our neighborhoods at our community scale to undertake mutual aid projects. And so I want to know uh, from your perspective, how much organizing is needed? You know, how much planning goes into establishing effective mutual aid networks and projects versus maybe we just got to do a little organizing and then, and then some things emerge. Um, so, yeah, I mean, how much can we expect to tap into things that are already going on versus how much do we need to, to be out there organizing? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I, I won't mince words. I think that the, the world we need to build is one in which we take back um, collective self-determination over everything in our lives that's currently funneled through capitalism that is destroying the planet and, you know, controls people through, you know, a racial, a racial capitalism that's colonial in the context of the U.S., right? So we, I imagine a world, sometimes I think about the stuff Naomi Klein says, you know, about like imagining where like, it's so messed up that the only way for me to get electricity where I live is through coal and other kinds of extraction projects that I don't believe in. But my only option is to like buy this electricity or, or if I'm wealthy enough, maybe I can have a home and buy solar panels, but it's a very individualized, 
There's no way to, to move with other people, especially if you don't have a lot of money. And what we want is something like where people who live together in a particular space have their own mini grid and decide together like how to have that in a way that they believe is sustainable or how to have a food system that they believe is sustainable or how to have a great, every system that we're kind of forced to use to survive um, locks us into like really horrifying extractive labor relations and extractive um, environmental relationships, right? Relationships to um, the earth and animals and, um, and energy. So I'm imagining, and when I think about like where I want this to go is for us to build so much it, it is mutual aid work when we create the ways of surviving together through collective self-determination instead of through somebody we don't know making a decision either in Washington DC or in Olympia or at, at some like global you know corporation that determines like how I get clothing how I get food how I get energy um so I think what that means in the day-to-day -day is first just like joining anything in our communities that where we get to practice the skills of making decisions together, of collaborating, of sharing, of trying to figure out hard problems. Like I love Joanna's stories about like people figuring out how to make a traveling battery that could charge an unhoused person's cell phone. Like just like our creativity, our, you know, people figuring out gray water systems, people figuring, you know, all the things that you, I know you all know for people who are in this um, webinar care about this kind of stuff and are inspired by this same kind of stuff. So part of it is like, all of us learning just how to join stuff, how to be in groups, how to collaborate together where no one's the boss and no one's getting paid, which is how most of this work will look, right? Because our opponents, the people who want to continue the systems that be, they have all the money. So we're not going to get paid to do this work. We're going to be doing it because we need to create a new world right now. And there's no, there's no too small way to start that. For some people, that's doing disaster prep workshops on their block so that we make sure that people we have batteries for people's um, medical devices if the lights go out, which they will, right? Or, or that we have water stored for the next, you know, storm or earthquake or whatever, or that we have masks for the next fire and smoke, you know? So that can be the way to go. Some people, it's doing it in a particular sub-community they're in, whether that's their ethnic or racial or religious community, or whether that's, you know, like whatever, wherever you naturally collaborate, maybe it's at the workplace, maybe it's at the school your kids go to, like it all, we kind of have to do it in all the places about all the systems. We don't have to do that with everything right away, but in an ideal world, like later when we've created this world, you know, maybe I work a lot at the health clinic that everyone can come to for free, but I also send my kids to the childcare thing or the school that everyone can use for free. And I also sometimes, and I also get my energy from there and I also get my food from this community farm. And we all are giving some time to some of those things. And there's some things I'm not giving any time to, but I still get the stuff for free. Like we're trying to build that much new infrastructure. And, and as you said, like, it's not, they're not going to do it for us. Actually, they criminalize people who try to do this a lot. Like it's, you know, this is oppositional work that takes power away from our opponents who are those who want to have people live in cages and have a small number of people in the world own everything and control everything. So this is radical work based in care and creativity. And we kind of have to do a lot more of it than we're doing now, which is not to overwhelm us, but just to be like, let's all start doing it right away and find out who's doing it anywhere that we can back up and help and support. Like I may be focusing on work supporting people in jails and prisons in my area, which is really essential mutual aid work, but I want to know what the community farm folks are doing and how I can back them up, how I can show up for them. You know, like I want to be networked with the, the, the as much of the picture as I can. Yeah. Thank you for that. It, it makes me think of uh, sort of keeping yourself physically fit. You gotta, you gotta start somewhere, take little steps, uh build those muscles and then you can take on more of the organizing uh that you know whatever you can handle in your community but yeah i think uh it's uh, yeah it's inspiring to think about how do we plug in and get involved as citizens and i want to come back to you uh eliza before uh getting back with you joanna uh lisa i, I want to know how you kept iou corvallis energized over this time frame and uh what specific organizing and leadership tactics you employed to to keep things going um, just kind of kind of use you as a little bit of a case study if we can sure yeah and i just want to amplify what um dean said around relationships and care and this is networked work it's not a personal you know it's not you and your it's not you by yourself organizing it has got to be in community and that i think is the most radical aspect of this work is that you know, the, the people in power want us to be individuals and they want us to get tired and they want us to not care for ourselves. And like, we can't do any of this without that community. So the first takeaway, if the only thing that you get from this webinar is like, 
go and make relationships and make your relationships really strong because those are the people who you're going to go to when the next crisis happens. And that's um, those relationships, I think, is how this program has continued. Um, it, it was not necessarily relying on the specific form of the program. It was more let's take stock of how each individual person in the mutual aid network is doing, check in with them. Oh, you're getting tired. This person needs to go back to their pre-pandemic life. We need to like readjust the program with them. They're taking their skills. So we don't have that skill set anymore. So how do we continue the mission of um, breaking down, breaking down the concept of deserving and undeserving in food and building community without individuals um, being a part of the, the planning process necessarily. So we started by one person who really wanted to get out into the community, going to restaurant owners and forming relationships with them, getting their personal cell phone numbers, um, welcoming them to the, the network. And then that person left to go back to her um, previous volunteer position. So then we shifted to a smartphone app and we got a tech person involved and that person figured out how to have a secure payment platform. So the restaurants can accept money, donor money, um, and they don't know, like we don't know what meal people are getting. We don't know um, how they're spending their money. And it takes me like 10 minutes a week to manage this program. We've included other social media acts, like, uh, volunteers. We've gotten a, a Python person to come and help. And I think it's going to shift in the next, uh, it's going to shift again. But as long as we continue along the original message of like, how do we continue to push back on the charity model and on um, who has control over what food they get and where, like, I'm cool with whatever form it takes. Yeah, yeah, I really appreciate the adaptability uh, that you're that you're managing this with, um, and and uh, and I want to highlight too again what what you highlighted from Dean and how important community and relationships are in this work, which which brings me around to you, Joanna, because the the part I want to uh, I'm hoping you can focus on is you know before you can build strong community ties. And before you have these relationships, you need to be able to build trust. And you've been working amongst, you know, a, a range of groups, established nonprofit organizations, communities of, of houseless folks. So I'm hoping you can talk about maybe some best practices or useful things you've learned in the street uh, about, you know, how, how to communicate and strengthen uh, relationships among folks and build the trust that's needed uh, for you to work together, uh, you know, and, and, and be able to have that strength to, to go head to head with the system. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of the division that we are facing comes back to like the charity model and sort of the divisions that our society is and white supremacy and racial capitalism have created, right? Um, like, and breaking those down, I think is such a powerful thing that way. Um, so many people like come to, yeah, like homelessness, like with the complaints and like that to me talks so much to the fear that, that like, you know, is like needs to be acknowledged before we can like move past that I think like much in like conversation about police and prison abolition like you have to come with like love and and understanding that the people's fear isn't just gonna be like can't just tell someone like don't be but like we can talk about like the racist war on drugs and how things and how our conditioning has taught us like what to be afraid of and like maybe deconstructing some of that um understanding like why drugs have been criminalized, like what drugs have been criminalized, like what kind of drug use is criminalized. Um, I think like capitalism silos people, um, the homelessness sector itself is incredibly siloed. Um, you know, many of the workers in that 
um, sector, or whatever, or know exactly what's wrong and have zero power in it. So, like, there's all these different elements um, that need to be activated. Um, and someone in the chat was mentioning like um, the connection of like indigenous practice with mutual aid, and I just keep thinking about this really amazing harm reduction webinar that Shira Hassan had and um, Native Youth Sexual Health Network, I think, um, did an interview with her where they're basically talking about how their work in mutual aid is like, it's not about like, you know, we're here to save you. It's, we're not here to tell you what to do. We're here to help figure it out together. And like, you can't do that without like talking to each other across our differences and understanding. Um, <laughs> but like also just seeing that people have gifts and it's not like I have everything and they have nothing. I think like Street Watch is definitely majority housed members. Um, and so how we negotiate that privilege without falling into the like saviorism and white guilt traps that are so prevalent um, in our society and ultimately do really benefit like the, the capitalist power structures, right? And prevent us from actually building power um, across difference. I think um, there's some really beautiful examples of that. Like we're not showing the government how to do it. Like they love to co-opt our work and we see it happen a lot in LA, but um, it is also to say like, hey, we did this on a shoestring budget. We did this on like some janky batteries we found on eBay. If it costs us nothing to do this, why can't the city, where is the city's money going? Where is the $187 million homelessness budget? Oh, it's mostly going to LAPD. It's It can be like an incredibly radicalizing um, moment for people to realize that there isn't the same scarcity that we're being told. Um, is the reason we can't have basic human rights. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a, I really appreciate the, the, the idea of acknowledging people's emotional states as you approach them. And then the, uh, also what struck me, that openness and love that you talk about, you know, it's not, I'm some savior here to help. No, it's, I'm here to understand and, and, and bear witness and be of whatever assistance I can be in community. Um, I want to I want to open that up a little bit more. This idea, if we if we conceive of mutual aid as being built on community and, and relationships, um, you know, all all three of you, you know, what what do you see as best practices uh, and things that you've learned uh, about how to communicate and and strengthen relationships in your mutual aid networks? I, I the reason I want to stay on this point is. I, I just think it's really tricky. Communication is where we stumble as creatures um, and figuring out uh, some ways that, that might help our audience as they uh, engage in mutual aid networks or try to organize some, some mutual aid projects of their own. What, what, what practices have you seen? And, and you can use negative examples too, if, if that's helpful. I'll just uh, jump in and just say, uh you know, a lot of my work is about this part, like how do we become people who could work in groups that are really participatory, that bring in everyone's wisdom. Most of us have just been at like schools and jobs and in families and in churches where there's like a boss or like someone on top. And we're really used to either trying to boss people around and become the boss, or we're used to like keeping our heads down and not really saying what we think and like kind of feeling avoidant. It's like, those are kind of the ways people survive emotionally, I think. Um, these conditions we live under where almost everything's coercive. And when we're building projects for resistance, we want to have a totally different skill set where I like really want to hear people disagree with me because I want the idea to get better. And I really want to um, share stuff and I want to be humble and learn and know that, that I don't know a lot of stuff. And I want to find out that I didn't realize I was like um, kind of exercising privilege or like being kind of dominant in ways that just were like baked into my socialization. And so a lot of my work and a lot of what my book is about is like, how do we actually build the decision-making methods together that listen to everybody instead of having somebody boss? How do we change our definition of leadership from a domination-centered one to a mutuality? Like as a leader, my real role is to help more people participate and more people feel ownership of the work and um, 
fully engage in decision making together? How do we um, shift from like kind of like business models? A lot of us have been encouraged to make our resistance work somehow look like a business. There's like an idea of social justice entrepreneurship, which I would love to never hear about again. There's like, you know, we're supposed to, we're supposed to organize our work into the nonprofit structure, which is ultimately very much shaped like businesses. Like there's an executive director who gets paid more than, you know, and it's very like, so how do we kind of um, be a, be more creative than that? And notice that of course, there's tons of models already out there. Um, and so I just, uh, the, the workshop series that I linked before is kind of all about that the nit nitty gritty of that. Um, and kind of looking at like, what are the things groups run into? Like we run into a lot of conflict in groups that we're usually not prepared to handle because we live in like a conflict averse society, which we're all really afraid of being wrong. And then we're really defensive. And if anyone gives us feedback, there's a lot of pieces to it. Um, but I think, uh, like this is kind of like actually the heart of the matter. It's not like a side issue. It's like the heart of the matter. Like how do we work together when we were put into a society that individualizes and atomizes us and puts us in competition? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that, Dean. <laughs> uh, Aliza, Joanna, you have any uh, sort of communication, either stumbling blocks or or uh, or successes that that you can think of that you want to share? Um, I could just quickly, I think like for us, like um, I've done like harm reduction work for people who use drugs and folks um, just for sexual health stuff like for a while, but like, I think that was a big growing moment in Streetwatch was like understanding that like people also deserve pleasure and that we're not just here to like, like save, like like do this, like someone in the chat was talking about like moving beyond the pro problem to a good life focus, acting together. Like, I think the public health version of harm reduction is very clinical. Like we've got to save lives with Narcan. And it's like, yes, we've got to save lives with overdose response and training across the board. But like, also not everyone who's using drugs needs to be saved. Like they maybe need tools and support and community love, but it, like, everyone deserves pleasure and I think like losing sight of that and becoming like having it become like only crisis centered or only like that again is like the slide into the saviorism the kind of disconnection from you know the person giving the aid to the person taking it um a sort of mythologizing or like um I don't know like yeah, mythologizing um, things that are that are basic practices and needs like using drugs or um, staying alive outside. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Joanna. But it, it constantly amazes me the sort of change your perspective uh, kinds of of uh, of ideas that pop up here. Uh, yeah, Lisa. Yeah, just super quick. I will share that um, we. Uh, had a big stumbling block in that we were not thanking our donors because I don't think we need to thank donors and our donor like a lot of big donors wanted to be thanked and they took their money elsewhere and um, I think that we could have done a better job of educating around why we're not thanking and what thanking donors does and how that perpetuates this charity-based narrative um, so just being more cognizant of um how how we can use our mutual aid networks to bring more people in and then how we can tap into larger pots of money so like i presented to city council and um using my uh you know power and privilege in that way we were able to get a big chunk of federal money and now i'm going to use that to say you know the next round do mini grants and do like do no strings attached giving at the government level and just see how that strengthens community based um, community led organizations. Um, so I just think that everyone has skills that they can bring into the space at all levels and as uncomfortable it's going to as it's going to make some of us, you know, don't say no to other people's skills. Thanks, Elisa. I was hesitant to bring up this this next topic that I wanted to ask the three of you, but you just gave me some courage, Elisa, because uh, uh, it 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 has to do with um, the role of mutual aid networks in changing the the broader system and rethinking governance. So the uh, you know the idea of mutual aid is this community scale response, right? And 
uh, often to a, an acute crisis, but uh, but it's it, it happens because the broader society, government, business, state market, whatever you want to call it, isn't cutting it and maybe even caused the problem in the first place. So I'm wondering if there's a role for mutual aid networks to kind of like punch up to address policy and governance and try to try to change uh, the system. And if so, <laughs> How do you know when to go for it and 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 go about it? And uh, just whoever, uh, all three of you, please, uh, if you have thoughts, um, just jump in. I'll just I'll start us. I, mean, I I think to me, mutual aid is only mutual aid if it has that broader agenda of getting to the root causes of the crisis. And so, what I see in all the movements I'm part of, you know, I'm part of the prison and police abolition movement. We all do mutual aid work directly supporting people who are currently criminalized and the families people are criminalized and the neighborhoods of people are most criminalized and people who are in immigration detention and all that. And we're all like trying to defund the police in our cities and uh, trying to stop any new jail or prison project from being built and trying to oppose a new police station they're trying to build, you know, like it's all tied together. Like mutual aid is, is, you know, we would never just like support unhoused people in our city and not be like, let's do something about the housing situation. You know, like, it's like, and I see that in Joanna's work, you know, in LA, there's been, there's a very vibrant housing justice movement there and has been many iterations of it for many, many decades. And it's people who are currently facing the worst kinds of housing insecurity and crisis and everyone else who they are friends with and cares about who believe in justice both like trying to address the immediate problems and fighting um, to change things. And I think we we want to structure our mutual aid projects so that they are explicitly political and oppositional. That's one way that they're different from charity is that they actually, they're not just like collaborating with corporations and governments. They're like pushing back. And so it's not just here, come charge your phone. It's here, come charge your phone. Fuck this shit. Let's organize. You know what I mean? And you don't have to organize to charge your phone, but that is the explicit context. And I, th I think about this a lot, like, I don't know. I don't think Joanna mentioned this, but in January 2020, people in the movement that she's part of were, you know, blocking sanitation trucks that were coming to Echo Park to clear. Um, they, you know, they got the sanitation truck schedule from the city, and then they would show up and put their bodies, it was beautiful, in front of the sanitation trucks that were coming to evict all the people living in the encampment in Echo Park, and um, that level of emboldenment. That's still mutual aid because it's putting ourselves between our people and the government's violence, but it's that next level of boldness and that kind of stopping the sweeps work is happening all over the country. People are trying to just stop cops from, you know, clearing parks and evicting people like that. I think that kind of boldness, including the level of boldness, that's like, let's push to make it impossible for them to fund the police in our city. Let's change the politics. And I think I'm talking about a very oppositional one. I'm not talking about like, let's all become city council members. Like there can be a version of this that becomes very like inside track, very minimal reforms, sometimes like legitimizing that system because oh look they have a formerly homeless person on there blah blah like we have to be really careful of that kind of co-optation piece but absolutely like this is a, this is a life and death and it's very oppositional to me yeah. yeah and I would just add like the reason that we were able to accomplish those kind of blockades and sweep defenses was because we had been building power in community with the folks there like we were like in in that community right and like had been doing the power up to so like that like I don't know that part like you can't you can't have like the I mean obviously like I think it's like the difference between revolt and revolution as like Kwame Torres said or something where it's like the revolt will maybe just happen like people do fight back all the time um but like the revolution happens through organizing and planning and building that base and like we're not just walking into an encampment being like stop the sweep right now like without first like asking folks like hey do you know what's up like do you want to like join you want to do you want support do you want to fight alongside us like across the city this is happening um and I wrote in the chat but I think like yeah, really wonderful book that kind of talks about the legacy of mutual aid projects in the service of like a greater revolution is the um, survival pending revolution. Um, and it's like the just this idea like that 
Huey P. Newton said, like the survival programs, like the, the breakfast program, those aren't answers or solutions, but they will help us to organize the community around a true analysis and understanding of their situation. And so like, I think a lot of people misunderstand that mutual aid is just trying to like show up to government or like, you know, wow, well, they didn't give out as many meals as the government did. So was it a success? And it's like, that's not what it was about. Like, <laughs> Uh, yeah, thanks. I, I wonder, Eliza, can you uh, expand a little bit? You said you went to the city council and um, and you're getting federal funding now. I'm just curious, like, how, what prompted that decision? How did you know, OK, we went from doing community organizing to now we're going to expand a little and involve uh, you know, government officials in this? Yeah, I think it was back to that original message of how do we continue to challenge the this deserving and undeserving narrative of who gets and who doesn't, and um, who who's the next audience that we can include. So I think that we did a pretty good job of including our, the community, and the community seemed to be on board with just on, on a large scale donating money and being okay with um, you know breaking down that their binary of poor and non-poor and who gets food and who doesn't and where they get food and what kind of food they get. Um, and now let's talk to big donor folks who have a lot of power and money and let's let's start to write grant applications, even if they're not funded, with our language that is challenging their dominant charity models so they see it. And so they see it written in words that are in their language, they understand, and it's like a little bit, it's moving the dial a little bit, and how can we support the the on the ground radical folks who are really breaking down the systems and doing the work that yeah. needs to happen? Like it's a both and. That's, um, yeah. that's really smart, and I appreciate it's a little bit sneaky too, like, you know, getting them to to see uh, uh, your point of view, even if, even if it, it isn't successful. Um, Okay, uh, one of the things I struggle with with this format is we've got so many people on uh, audience members and I, I really appreciate the way you've been engaging uh, with one another um, on, on the chat um, and we often don't get to get to your questions, but we have a little bit of time. So I wanna do that. Uh, oddly enough, Dean, I think you just uh, uh, pointed to this too. Uh, we have a question about you know, let's say you're in a rural area and there aren't a lot of networks or resources around, uh, you know, what do you uh, recommend that, that people do in that situation? Yeah, I just put this in the chat, but I, I you know, I, I hear about a lot of different kinds of rural uh, mutual aid happening. It's a lot of the same stuff, you know, people are facing housing insecurity, um, criminalization. A lot of a lot of prisons in the U.S. are in rural areas. There's a lot of really amazing um, rural work happening to organize around supporting people who are in prisons. Um, you know, through visits, through uh, pen pal programs, through support when people get out. You know, all of that. I've, there's a you know a lot of people, a lot of rural migrants in the U.S. work in the farming and food industries and face everything from like toxic exposure to um, pesticides, to wage theft, to, you know, ice raids. Um, I know people who are doing work to like create safety planning for people around ice arrests so that their kids don't get taken into the foster care system or like um, people who are doing like roadblock warnings when, so that people can know if ice is coming into an area and then like spread the word through a phone tree quickly so that people um, are aware that ice is in the area and can get off the roads. Um, a lot of people doing work. There's a lot of like, you know, people living either like in trailer homes on in like, or in vehicles in places where the cops are going to raid them or where they're being exploited or abused by whoever owns that land that those vehicles or trailer homes are on. I've heard about this really recently in North, North Carolina, this really brilliant kind of mutual aid project that emerged inside this trailer park where the um, owners of the trailer park are just really, really uh, harm, harmful to the people living there in lots of different ways. But one of the ways is they constantly get all their vehicles towed and people are super poor. And so people just surrounding the vehicles and not letting the tow trucks tow them. I mean, just like really basic stuff that's about people helping each other survive and the ways that spins into then people knowing their neighbors, being able to trust each other with a lot of things, being able to support each other when there's family violence, when there's drug stuff, when there's mental health stuff, when there's the next, you know, weather disaster. So 
Um, I think kind of like starting anywhere where there's need. I think some people use um, communities of faith as models for this, right? It'd be ideal for us all to have people visit us in the hospital and these kinds of things, whether or not we're religious, you know? So like, are there things that churches and religious communities do for people, take care of each other's kids, visit each other in the hospital, support each other when someone passes, like ways of just deepening those relationships that lead to things like, you know, having someone stay in your basement for a while and they get out of prison or helping someone who's, you know, a young person who's out of home and doesn't have a safe place to live. Like we're just trying to catch all the people falling into the most, uh, you know, dangerous um, systems. Um, and, you know, through that build like a, like social relations that we can survive um, and build projects. Then we're all working together to say no pipeline or no, you know, um, fracking or whatever in our areas. Um, so I think it's like, for me, those things often seem very connected. Yeah, thanks a lot, Dean. I, I'm seeing also in the chat, uh, our, our participants are sharing other ideas too. So yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, okay, uh, gosh, where's the time go? I wanna, I wanna give each of you uh, two to three minutes just to kind of sum up, uh, leave our audience with whatever message you want to leave them with um, and, and uh, yeah, hopefully uh, geared towards, um, you know, let's let's all get out there and participate in mutual aid projects and networks. So uh, yeah, let's start with uh, let's start with you, Joanna. Put you on the spot. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. No pressure. Um, yeah, I think like something that's been really impactful for me is is locating the mutual aid work we're doing right now in like a in a history of struggle and like a legacy of struggle. And I think. Um, like so much is working to isolate us and make us feel powerless. Like I have a lot of arguments with my mom about this. She's, she's constantly like, I don't know what I can do. I don't feel like I can do anything. And it's like, yeah, when you watch the news every day, check the timeline, it, that's, it's designed to make us feel that way. Right. And so like, we don't learn about uh, like mutual aid projects in communities across the years and like um like we certainly don't learn about like homeless organizing across the years so it's amazing to have folks doing that kind of work in even like academic institutions um I think like the mutual aid can be like a thing that can spark um like political action and and um like actual solidarity and collective power um like talking about rural areas, um, folks that maybe were affected by those wildfires in Northern California, um, who never thought about working in community. Um, and that can go one of two ways as we're seeing, right? As people's needs aren't being met more and more, there's the danger of things sliding to the far right. Um, fascism is very like easy to sell certain populations in America, I think. Um, and so it's like, it's our duty more than ever to think about ways that we can actually activate people's, um, like humanity, I guess. I don't know if it's humanity, but just, um, yeah, like rooting in, in like collective needs and how like that, how tied that is to like a social justice struggle, um, ultimately and like, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, there's so much more work to do, but I think it's like something that's been incredibly healing for me. Like there is so much that I've grown up in my life with that's been relegated to like a stigma shame area and um, like building mutual aid as something that's like a source of power rather than a source of charity or um, like marginalization um I think there's so much there um and yeah it's yeah. always more more work to do which is actually really awesome and exciting too <laughs> beautiful thank you Thanks. Joanna I uh yeah it's really empowering to think of the legacy and to think of the healing properties that you're bringing up okay uh yeah Lisa please uh floor is yours Oh man. Yeah. I just want to say that just being in spaces like this is so healing and I'm so grateful for all of you and this, you know, putting on this webinar. I think this is one thing that we can do is just be in spaces that affirm our radical beliefs and continue to validate us and 
then go into the work and do all the into the world and do all the translation work and come back to our our solid relationships and feel energized um and yeah like joanna said i just think the most radical thing we can do is enjoy life and put all of our energy into good um healthy relationships um yeah if if we have extra think about our extra and think about where we can give it with no strings attached um and just educate ourselves i think that's the most important thing um right now and then just be ready like get your neighbor's cell phone number even if they have scary political signs in their front yard and you know that's probably really scary to hear but like i live in a rural area and they're going to be the ones who are going to help me leave with my goats during wildfire um and then maybe i can talk to them later about their political signs so i just think that um getting beyond getting beyond the surface to the the deep like human commonality that we all do want to help and that this system is horrible for everyone and it impacts some of us more than others, but really it's it's harmful to everyone. And if um, the more we can come together around that and decide we all need to radically shake things up in all of our spaces, the easier it will be for everyone. Yeah, thanks, Eliza. Really, really beautiful sentiment. Okay, Dean, uh, some final final thoughts from you? Yeah, I think the other thing is like, <clears throat> just having the skill of being willing to see where we actually are caught up in the systems and, and operating them. I think um, whenever I say this about the charity model and nonprofits, there's a, people can feel really defensive because I mean, I spent my life working in nonprofits, like, and we all are like working our asses off and we're like, oh my God, like, how can anyone critique this? But actually like, if we're trying to win, we gotta be willing to be like, maybe there is something weird about rich people deciding what we get to do in these groups that cause philanthropy runs nonprofits. And like, it's like, it's not about, giving up or saying it was all pointless or that we didn't have good intentions there, but just being like, there's a limited set of things that can happen inside structures that are funded by our opposition and rich people are, are, are our opposition. They are, they, if they wanted to give all their money away, then they would stop being. And so, you know, they're on some level trying to maintain the existing system. Um, and they, even if they, had, even if they have lovely intentions, they still are like, oh, I like homeless people better if they're kids or if they're not felons or, you know, they, they're still implementing these stigmatizing, often racist colonial frameworks. And so just being like, yeah, absolutely. Whatever we, you know, beg, borrow and steal and do what you can, where you are, wherever you are, I work inside a university. It's like, not like, I mean, that's like a, you know, that's a place that's um, implicated in all kinds of harm, harmful things, but um, but also just not being un not being afraid to be frank about the limitations of certain places and strategies and not needing to defend or try to just feel good. You know, like as people who are care about the like state of the earth, we're like, okay, it's not a good time to try to feel good. <laughs> it's a good time to be, to be real, to be discerning and to have really strategic um, action based on that discernment and to listen to people whose views we might not see. Like maybe people here haven't heard the disability justice critique of the, of the, of the charity model or the critique from black communities, of the charity model, because th if that's not the work you've been doing, find out about it. It's relevant to the work we're all doing. So just being like that kind of voracious learner who's willing to find out also about the complicated things, about the things I've already tried and not defend that, but instead just onward, onward, like how do I become more and more aligned with what I really believe in and not judge or shame myself for the fact that that's an ongoing process for every single person, you know? Well, well, th thank you so much to the three of you, Eliza, Joanna, Dean, uh, so much to think about, uh, to study up, and of course, to go out and do. Um, the last thing that I would want anyone to feel is overwhelmed though, because any small step is appreciated we all need to play a role in, in building community. And there are so many ways to, uh, to go about it. And I think we've hopefully delivered a, a, a nice menu for you to, to think about. Um, thank you to all of my colleagues at Post Carbon Institute who helped put this together. Uh, wouldn't happen without them. And thanks to all of you who have joined us today and participated. Uh, we wouldn't do this if you if you weren't interested. And we really do hope you'll take this to heart and and go out and and do good things in your communities. So uh, thanks to everybody for joining us. We'll be getting you the resources that that have uh, that we've shared in this webinar and the previous one. 
and uh, look forward to continuing the conversation. Thanks again, Aliza, Joanna, Dean, for the just, uh, yeah, just beautiful work that you all do in this world. Really heartfelt appreciation. Thank you. Thanks, Post Carbon. <laughs>